Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another SNEA educational webcast. Today, we're going to talk about trends and use cases in object storage. My name is Christine McMonigal. I'm the director of hyperconverged marketing for Intel. And with me today is Alex McDonald. He's an independent Hello, consultant. Hello. And also the vice chair of the Networking Storage Forum. David, Director of Computational Storage at Samsung. Say hello, David. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And John, the Chief Marketing Officer at Cloudian. Hello. Hello. All right. Let me go on here. All right. In case you are not familiar with SNEA, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background. We're a global not-for-profit association dedicated to advancing the adoption of storage technology. We do so using vendor neutral status to develop industry-wide standards for which the, we enlist the help of subject matter experts in our membership community. And then we promote the standards to increase awareness and use educational programs to drive adoption. There are a number of different working groups and forums in SNEA. Today, it's the Networking Storage Forum presenting to you, and here's a list of the technologies that our forum covers. And let me briefly cover the legal notice before we get into the body of the presentation. This is a standard legal disclaimer. The basis is to remind you that the material is under SNEA copyright, it can be used as is without any modifications as long as you credit SNEA. And also there's no warranties expressed or implied in the content of this presentation. Okay, so we're gonna spend about the first half hour today talking about object storage characteristics, use cases, and some trends on accelerating object storage using computational storage. And then we're gonna open it up to a round table Q and A. So as you think of questions during the presentation, please start entering them in the little questions button over on the right side of your screen. I also wanna point out that under attachments, you'll find a copy of this presentation. So if you wanna download it after the webinar, you are welcome to do so. All right, with that, let me hand it off to Alex. <laughs> We've already had our first question. What does SNEA stand for? The Storage Networking the Industry storage Association. I have to clear that one straight off. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do this morning really quick is just cover uh, at a high level some object storage characteristics. I want to make sure that people understand the difference between object storage and other types of storage, and in particular to try and separate out the underlying storage from the thing that sits over the top of it that gives it, uh, it its, its object flavor. So I, th I, th I think the best way of starting this is to try and perhaps start from where people are most comfortable, which is something that we know and know well. So how can we visualize object storage? And I'm warning you, this is hugely simple. If anyone quotes this back to me as being particularly technical, I'm going to have a hairy canary. This is this is really simplified. Uh, let's talk a little about block storage. If you think about block storage, it's really uh, the underlying characteristic of the devices on which we're storing our data. And if you think back a little, you don't need to think back too far to spinning rust, you know, disk drives. Then we were accustomed to addressing disk drives in blocks, fixed blocks uh, by block number. So basically, we, we had data, which was the block itself, and then a block number, which is a little bit of metadata that told the drive which block we were interested in reading or writing or updating for that matter. So the idea behind block storage is really simple interface. It, it's almost mapping directly onto the characteristics of particularly disk drives. It doesn't really match other storage technologies terribly well, but it, 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 for disk drives, it does pretty well. And I'll cover the characteristics, the bits below these boxes, in, in, in a second. 
Then we developed file storage. Uh, and in fact, file storage has a long history going back to the beginnings of Unix and, and pro probably before as well. But file storage is, is really a simple thing whereby we still got data and we still live on this block address device. But this time a file is a metadata. It's a, it's a name that contains a list of the blocks that make up this particular file. So a file can be named mycv.txt, for instance. And the blocks on disk are represented by the block numbers held in that metadata, which is data about data, that are stored in the file structure. The other thing that a file system has is a hierarchy. So I can have mycv.txt inside a directory called documents, inside the directory called Alex, inside the directory called, and so on. You know, so basically we have a hierarchy of, of names that allows us to identify the file and retrieve the blocks that make up that file. And then we've now got objects. And in fact, I want to talk a little as well about key value storage, but object storage, all we have there is just this big or small blob, a binary object, and some key by which we address that object. And it's a flat structure. There's no hierarchy. There's no structure as such to this data. It's simply an object which occupies a certain amount of space and a certain size, and then a key. But it also has a huge amount of metadata, descriptive data associated with it. I'll come back to that in a second. The one thing I want to focus in on here, there are some examples given at the bottom of you know how you might want to think about the characteristics of block or file or object. But there's one in particular that I think we ought to look at a bit further because it's going to feature in David's part of the presentation, and that's performance. Block has always been seen as high performing, and file has been seen as, okay, high performing, but not quite in the same league because of the overlying uh, infrastructure, the APIs that sit on top of it. And then object has always been seen as a distant third, partly because we think of object data as being in the cloud, and the cloud being a somewhat remote and distance thing uh, as we're uh, retrieving or writing our data. But we're going to talk a little about performance today, and I'd just like to point out that performance is not necessarily the preserve of block data, and that object data can be as fast, and we're going to take a look at that, and the use cases that John's going to cover are going to demonstrate that this, these characteristics that object storage has that make it different from block or file are very valuable. The one other thing I just want to really quickly note, in terms of block data, you've got one attribute or one piece of metadata, and that's a block number. In terms of the file, we've got things like its size, we've got its open and close times. We have various fairly simple and straightforward attributes, the file name in particular. But with an object, we can have custom metadata. We can have metadata that describes the object in a number of ways. We can describe the object, for instance, by associating a metadata with color. So a thing can be red, blue, green, yellow, whatever it might be or to do with the nature of that particular object. I'm a video, I'm a static picture, or even more refined than that, we can have a set of videos stored as objects where we can actually describe the contents, helicopter taking off, um, comedy skit, whatever it might be. So I'm being asked to give an example for an object. An object might be something like a video clip or a photograph or a piece of text just it, and, and the system basically doesn't understand that object when you're storing it. All that it understands is it's, it's a binary object, it's one thing, and it's got bunches of metadata associated with it. And it's the application that gives that metadata meaning. So having described loosely object storage, I want to describe key value, which may sound pretty similar. Key value storage is where you've got a key and you go out and you read and write an update based on that key. And that key can be anything. That key can be you know, a binary number. It could be a string, whatever it might be. But basically, there are similarities between object storage and key value storage. Key value is a bit simpler, however. So the similarities are, with an object, you've got the URI, which is the equivalent of the key, the Euro uniform uh, resource name for this particular object. And it can be an arbitrary string, and so can key value. The data part can be any size. Objects can be from zero bytes up to humongous size. 
whatever size you want the object to be. And the same is true of key value. The difference is, however, key values don't have metadata or attributes. So there's none of this ability to say, this is a video and it's got a helicopter in it and three people. You, can't have, you don't have that key value. Key value also differs in that because of the way that we tend to use it, it offers strong consistency. Consistency is all about if I update something or write something, can I be guaranteed that that update or write took place? And key value offers that as a feature. But as objects, sometimes, and they're object systems, that don't provide you with that consistency. The other thing that's quite important is the key value storage is device level. It's a bit like block data on, on disk. Key value is device level only, whereas an object can span many devices and a kind of location independence. So in summary, an object is made up of unique key, as is a key value store, a value, which is the data associated with the key, as is a key value store, but you can have zero or more metadata attributes, which may not be unique, to further describe the data that we're storing or retrieving. And that's not true of key value. That has to be built using separate metadata when you're using key value. And also remember, it only lives on one device. So the kind of way that we access these objects, and I, I'm presuming that most people will have come across Amazon S3, an interface or internet-based object store that's accessed via HTTP. It's not quite as straightforward. It's not just a bunch of objects with unique identifiers. It's not quite a flat, nameless environment because ob objects in S3 are stored in named buckets. So I give my bucket a name and then I store objects inside that bucket. And that's the bit that provides the uniqueness is the bucket and the object ID that give, give us the unique uh, uh, placement of that particular piece of data. And, and there are other differences as well between the way that Amazon treats object storage, but in the main, we can build pretty successful object APIs over the top of Amazon's S3. One of those interesting challenges has been taken up by uh, Kubernetes, uh, who are building a, another object interface. There are loads of them already, but here's another one called Cozy. And the reason is that, and I, I put these in quotes because these are actually the quotes from Kubernetes people themselves. It abstracts currently file and block storage via the, the, the CSI standard, but it doesn't do a terribly good job of object because the primitives for file and block storage don't extend well to object storage. There are big differences in the way that you uh, um, apply uh, uh, operations to object storage. For instance, in a file environment, you open a file, read and write to the file, and then close the file. In an object store, you don't do that. You simply read it by object ID, or you write it by object ID. There's no concept of opening or closing a particular objects. And the other thing is that there's no common protocol for consumption across various implementations of object storage. And that surprises a lot of people. People tend to think, ah, that's interesting, object storage. There must be one way of accessing it, as we've got one way for files, sort of. We've actually got two. We've got SMB and NFS. But for objects, there are several ways, and it depends on the vendor. There's a commonality. People are beginning to move towards standards like S3 for accessing and managing objects, but there is no common protocol, and COSI is attempting to provide that common protocol for object storage via COSI. So the underlying storage is the way we store things is different. We access them differently. We have the idea of having a key, a value, and a set of metadata that allow us to manage object storage. So and were there any, oh, what, what, what is Amazon S3? Well, go out and search on Amazon S3. I mean, it's basically Amazon providing you with a storage environment that's object-based. And key value is a really simple idea. If you've got a key, I can give you back the value associated with it. And if you write something with that key, that's the data that we're going to write associated with the key. So I'm going to hand over now to John, who's going to take us through some of your storage use cases. Thank you, John. Indeed. Indeed. Hey, thanks very much. Yeah, and, and the question on, on Amazon S3 is, is one we get a lot because that's a, that's, that is a point of some confusion 
Uh, Amazon S3, of course, refers to the service, as we all know, the AWS S3 service. Unfortunately, that exact same name also applies to the API, the, the language of object storage. Uh, and that, that gets confusing a lot. Uh, people get the two mixed up. But the, having that standard language is, is so critical because as, as we've already pointed out, that created the platform that everyone could write to, that everyone could adopt as you know, the new way of talking to object storage that we can all agree on and you know, we can all benefit from the work that others are doing. And that's what I'll talk about here is some of the use cases for object storage and how that S3 API acceptance and support has really you know, created an industry. And the first thing I'll talk about is, is ransomware protection, because you know, ransomware is something that's been on everyone's mind, especially for the last few years of COVID. The, the increase in ransomware attacks has been phenomenal. And the beauty here is that object storage is an ideal solution for this. It provides a bulletproof environment for protecting data from encryption by hackers. Interestingly, object storage was originally designed as an immutable storage vault. That was the original uh, use for object storage when it was brought to market some years ago. Uh, it's, it's by no means the only use now, as we know, it's used for all kinds of persistent data. But you know, that uh, idea of immutability, unchangeability was something that was early on in the, in the object storage world. And that fact that you can store data and make it unchangeable makes it perfect for protecting your data from ransomware. If you cannot change the data, you can't encrypt it. So the way this works is that, is that co companies now back up their data to an object storage vault using standard backup software. So this is where that S3 API becomes so critical because not only can they write the data using a standard API, but they can also create an immutable data vault using the standard API with a command called object lock. So this is now a, you know, an S3 standard as part of the AWS nomenclature. So the data is written to this object storage device, and then you create an immutable data vault by applying the object lock policy. Once that policy has been applied, ransomware cannot change that data. It's like putting a time lock on your data. You, you, can't, you cannot get in to change it. You can retrieve it, you can do a restore from it, no problem there, but you can't change it. So it's protected from uh, uh, ransomware encryption. Now, as I said, this is a time lock. So you're going to you're going to have a policy that's going to say, I'm going to keep that data immutable for 90 days. During that 90 days, I'm going to write new copies. I'm going to have you know other layers of incremental backups or even full backups. So at the end of that 90 days, I've already got new copies. I can delete that original one. So it's not like your data is accumulating forever. It's being kept under control. The beauty of this is this is the first time you've had a, a backup protection, a, a backup uh, service with immutability that is completely automated. And this is where that S3 API is so critical because now you have a standard for how you can write the data, how you can protect the data. Everyone can use it. Multiple vendors support it and it becomes something that's part of a standard backup workflow. So during the last two years, this has been a leading use case for object storage and has really driven a lot of the attention in the media because of the ransomware problem. So a really exciting uh, use case. The other thing that's you know, really good for the object storage is the scalability, you know, the fact that you can grow it essentially limitlessly, which makes it great for media files, which tend to be large. Uh, the other great thing about object storage is the metadata, the fact that you can store metadata along with the user data and make that data searchable. In fact, there are AI tools for going into your user data for video and in, enriching that metadata. So for instance, they might go in and look for specific places like, you know, here's a picture of Big Ben or here's a picture of Jenner, Jennifer Aniston. And you can put that information in the metadata so you can then go and search it. So this is a great example of a, a broadcaster, WGBH in Boston. They're a, a PBS broadcaster and producer. They produce, I, I believe, five, seven different shows for PBS. Their workflow previously was very linear with a storage medium in kind of in the middle of the workflow. So it took a long time for stuff to get to that, you know, consolidated storage device. And then once it was on it, um, it took a while longer for that data to become truly usable. 
they reorganize the workflow with object storage in the middle of the workflow. So now the data, as soon as it's ingested, goes onto object storage. And from that point can be accessed by whoever needs it. So it can go into an editing environment or some other post-production effects environment. It can be shared off to customers who are looking for specific clips, you know, very important for news that to make those clips available quickly. Previously, it took them weeks to make data you know, available for purchase by customers. Now they can do it very, very quickly because as soon as it's ingested, it goes into that shared environment. The second thing they can do with this is it's cloud compatible. So a really key feature of object storage is the fact that because we use the same API as the cloud, the same language, it's very easy to achieve cloud compatibility. And WGBH uses that by creating a copy in the cloud for data protection and also for access by other types of environments, such as you know they've got a, a, a content distribution environment called Sony C, which also uses the S3 API. So you can see there's a number of different attributes of object storage that come in handy here. You've got the S3 API, which makes it compatible with our other applications that use S3. It makes it cloud compatible. You've got the metadata, which is being stored along with the user data for search. And then of course, you've got the scalability, which makes it you know, easy to put all their assets in one place. And then finally, it's self-protecting. You know, the fact that the data is, once it goes into object storage, it is automatically being distributed across multiple devices and locations. So if you have any failures of devices or locations, you still have access to the data. So you know, a great example of a number of different attributes at play. Another common use for object storage is to provide cloud services in environments where you don't want data going into a public cloud. And this example here is, is MillCloud. It's the cloud for Department of Defense contractors and agencies. So this is a cloud which is run by General Dynamics, but it's specifically for the DOD. So of course they don't want, you know, security is paramount. They don't want the data being you know, spread around. You want security to be paramount in your mind, but they want all the same capabilities as a public cloud service. They want the ability to scale. They want, you know, storage on demand. They want, you know, data protection, everything they expect in a public cloud they want, but it has to be secure. And that's a really key L attribute of public, of, of, uh, of object storage is that when you're creating a private cloud, or a public cloud with a specific user community, you can mimic every cloud attribute. You can you know, manage multiple tenants within a shared environment securely. You can create you know, billing so every, every environment, every user knows what they're doing. You can create quality of service controls so that each user is guaranteed to get the service level they're expecting. And obviously you can store files as well as objects. So, most object storage systems include some kind of a file front end such that you can store SMB or NFS files in that environment as well. It's, it's usually not the primary purpose of the underlying platform, but that compatibility is there if you need it. Another area where this privacy really becomes paramount is in the area of data sovereignty, particularly with sovereign clouds. And by sovereign clouds, I mean a country or a state or some other entity that needs to have a cloud where the data is with, held within their own boundaries. And this is becoming really critical in EMEA. Uh, we're seeing this other places too across APJ, the need to create a a cloud environment where you know that data is not going outside of that geographic boundary. Data privacy has become a huge concern worldwide. People want to know where their data is. They want to be, make sure that all of their local regulations can be complied with. And that can be very difficult if you don't have control over the entire environment. So sovereign cloud, the idea of creating a public cloud that's unique to your specific locale has become another really big use case for object storage again because you can get all the same attributes as a as a you know worldwide public cloud environment but you can do it within specific geographic boundaries another really exciting part of object storage is in, is in data management and the ability to put data where you need it 
And that can be done for, for data collection or it can be done for data protection. And in this, in this particular example of this uh, uh, sheriff's office in Louisiana, they're looking at data management from a protection standpoint. They want that data to be always available regardless of what happens. So think, think about you know Louisiana, the state, it's on the coast, Gulf Coast. It's in a hurricane prone territory. And there, this parish, Calcasieu Parish, happens to be right on the coast. So very, you know, there's a risk of their infrastructure being upset or you know, disrupted by hurricane. And that can affect both their short range communications and long range communications. So they've taken a you know, very proactive approach toward data management. And that is they're gonna keep a copy at, at their own sheriff station and this is data that's being collected for digital evidence, for video evidence, you know, everything that they're collecting as part of their ongoing operations. They're going to keep a copy at their local office. They're going to keep a copy at a second office, which is located some distance away. And they're going to keep a copy in the public cloud. Well, all three of those are, are important to them because if they lose any piece of the communications infrastructure, they, they still have other pieces up and running and they can access their data. They can keep their law enforcement operations running. But by doing this, they've created a really belt and suspenders approach that gives them re, you know, resilience, redundance, reliability, durability, et cetera, and does it in a way which is really easy to manage because it's the same API, the same set of tools, the same set of you know, finders and search tools. They can use the same tools everywhere, both at their local location, at their remote location, and at the public cloud location. It's all the same API. It's all the same capabilities. So it makes it really easy for them to uh, manage data, even though it's a fairly complex environment. And another example of this is in IoT and remote data collection. So one thing we're seeing a lot right now is a lot of interest in data collection and analysis at the edge. You know, how do I collect data at the edge and then make it accessible you know, wherever it needs to be, and whether I'm analyzing it at the edge or I'm moving it somewhere else to be analyzed. And this example uh, from a bus line, there's a municipal bus service in the city of Montebello in Southern California, is a great example of that because they, they wanted to collect data from transit operations and buses. They're out running around city streets and they wanted that data to be instantly accessible at a central location such that they know what's going on in their bus line at all times, even regardless of where the buses are. And they had a very specific reason for this. They, it's safety. They want to ensure rider safety and by monitoring what's going on in the buses, they can do that. When I say monitoring, that's looking at video from the buses, looking at sensor data, such as speed, such as engine conditions, such as you know brakes on the bus, um, weather conditions outside. You know, they can look at all these things through, through various sensors and collect the data and have a complete picture of what's going on. Well, object storage was the ideal environment for this because by collecting all that data on object storage, a, they can collect every data type because it's all running into the S3 API. B, they can make the metadata readily accessible so they can go back in time and search for specific information they're looking for. And three, they can instantly access it using the, you know, the real-time access of object storage. One thing that, you know, as, we, as we've moved through storage evolution and moved away from tape, Another huge advantage we've gained by moving into object storage is that real-time access. So if you want to analyze information, if you want to quickly retrieve it, object storage just provides you know, the, the simplest, most robust, um, you know, easiest access way of doing that. And this is that attribute of being you know, distributed and easily accessed is going to become so critical as we move more and more into edge computing environments. You know, a, a big part of AI and machine learning is going to be collecting and analyzing data. You can't analyze it if you don't collect it, but you have to be able to you know, quickly access it to be able to analyze it. And the challenge there is if you're having to move data around all the time, if you're having to collect it in one location and then move it to another place and then analyze it, you're putting a lot of lag in the process and a lot of cost 
you know, the data movement <laughs> is expensive. <laughs> so if you can just analyze it where it sits, that's a huge benefit. And that's where object storage comes in so handy because of its distributed nature. So we've talked about, you know, the metadata, we've talked about the immutability, we've talked about the scalability, but another huge attribute is the distributed nature. Because this is a single storage system where you can put devices anywhere you need them, you can now put devices next to where the data is being created. And that means you can collect the data where it resides, you can analyze the data where it resides, and you can get real-time information as opposed to having to you know, collect it in one place, move it someplace else, and then do the analysis on it, which is gonna be time consuming and expensive, you can get to that answer much, much faster. And this is kind of the, the brave future of where this is headed as we move from you know, a cloud-centric world to a cloud and private cloud and edge world. It's, it's really amazing how this is all evolving and object storage is playing a central role. And that's, that's it for me. Um, I like, I really like how this presentation flows with Alex telling us about object storage, what it is, and then you sharing some very uh, thought provoking use cases. So I suppose my next step here is to show how we would actually implement object storage, uh, whether it's in the field or up in uh, some interim point uh, and give us a hands-on example here. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, with this uh, proposed solution. So um, we have at Samsung uh, an approach that we've come up called high performance object store acceleration on S3 Select. So let's talk through this. So S3 Select, first of all, that's a filtration or filtering of the, uh, the S3 data object store data. And so the, the challenge here is to uh, provide queries on this object storage as fast as possible and look for infrastructure efficiencies uh, to allow us to accelerate that process. So if we look on the left side first, let's go through this recipe. So if we're performing these queries, the first thing that we are doing with the system on the right is to transform the data to key value stores, as Alex was describing at the beginning of our presentation. Um, in parallel, we're tagging and partitioning the data using computational storage drives. Computational storage drives are basically what they sound like. They are uh, solid state drives that have a compute resource within, uh, which allows acceleration of specific functions. So, so we, we've conquered the first and second steps, and now we can perform queries running on computational storage, in this case as a NVMe over fabric target. So if we go to the, the right side here, just to drill down a little further, we can see that we have these different frameworks uh, and application sets from Spark, Hadoop, Presto, et cetera. And uh, they are creating the content through S3 services, which then could become filtered and then transformed and supported with key value storage API and libraries, we call that KV select. And then we're going to move that data into the computational storage drive where we're going to provide that um, the query search function and basically accelerate that whole process. So the benefits in doing so are first, we're going to speed up those queries because we don't have to uh, send them up to, say, the cloud to be processed. We can do them locally, which means we will uh, basically cut, if not eliminate, our network traffic up to the cloud and therefore provide a lower TCO because we don't have to pay for those cloud instances. And we can actually utilize existing infrastructure on premise. And we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit about that further. 
Um, so we're reducing CPU load. We're, we're also reducing network traffic. That's a good thing. The use cases, um, these complement what John already walked through um, for both large scale, real-time analytic requirements across smart cities, smart homes, medical, video imagery, of course, and maintaining security by, able, by being able to perform these queries uh, locally uh, so that we're, we're following the, the rules and regulations of, and the policies that, that protects our data. All right, so this is the uh, A versus B comparison, the A being Amazon, where we, use, we consider them to be the baseline. So on the left side is the, uh, the Amazon S3 uh, service stack of uh, servers that is sending the data out to uh, a cloud instance to be uh, to filtered and be to query, to be queried. The bottom side is where we're, we're extracting the data, but we're keeping that data local. And we're performing the uh, KV transform on localized servers that do have smart uh, accelerators within them. We call these computational storage devices. And so the A versus B drag race or comparison here is on this uh, this specific object store set of data um, where we're going through a, a song record uh, and sorting by specific filter types or uh, tagging. So then we go to the next slide. And this just, just gives us a, a further drill down on actually what's happening. So the S3 client app is sending out a query request. It's getting pushed down into the uh, computational storage drives. And then that result is being uh, from the query that which is being performed on the drive is being sent back up to, uh, to the host for uh, either a, a real time decision that's being made or some result that can be provided for uh, further analysis. And here's the result. So we're able to see 6x better performance on that S3 uh, to KV transform using computational storage on our high performance object store uh, solution. And also we're significantly reducing the latency in this case by 5x on the AWS standard baseline uh, compared to the, the HPOS demonstration. The other really neat thing here is that if we look at that localized server that's running that key value uh, transform and supports the libraries, um, the CPU is barely awake, right? It's, it's only consume, we're only consuming 0.15% uh, of that CPU resources. So it can do all sorts of other things uh, beyond just this, this uh, specific example. So it's really exciting that we're able to um, not only benefit from applications that are using object storage, but uh, coming up with novel approaches to accelerate and provide real-time analytics uh, to the application developer as well as to the user themselves. And that's what I have. Great, thanks, David. Great to see this um, example use case of how these technologies could intersect and be used together. So let me give a let me give a quick summary here of what we've discussed so far. Um, first, you know, Amazon Web Services Object Storage Service S3 um, really has introduced object storage to a broader audience and helped to drive acceptance of object storage. The growth of object storage has really mirrored the growth of container usage as well. Object storage, as we've seen from John, is suitable really for a, for a broad range of use cases in the data center today and in the cloud. And object storage and computational storage can be complementary technologies used to improve performance. 
So let us, let us now move into the round table q and I'm going to put all of us on the bigger screen here so you can see us a little more clearly. And let me look and see what questions we've got here. We've got some good questions. All right, first of all, I can tell you the cozy one at the bottom. Okay, yeah, so for Kubernetes, if the client is the app, why is that CSI interface or COSI even required? So if you think of what Kubernetes is doing, it's actually an orchestrator. It's not actually doing a great deal apart from making sure that all the resources, well, one of its roles is to make sure that all the resources required by the application in the container get appropriately assigned to the container when the container is being spun up. And one of, one of the big differences between container storage interface, the CSI interface, which deals with block and file storage, is that object storage doesn't have, for instance, the concept of minting a volume. So normally in, in the CSI environment, you would mount several volumes or one volume uh, to, to actually allow the container and the application in the container to go talk to that volume. You actually have to do an external mount so that, and, and, and the Kubernetes environment does that before it spins up this container. And then the inside the application, inside the, sorry, the application inside the container can then access the volume. That's not true of objects. Objects don't need to mount volumes. Objects just go out there and talk something object-like to an external environment. So the kind of management interfaces, which is really what we're talking about with Kubernetes, are necessarily different from object than they are for file and block, which is why they've decided to implement COSI rather than taking CSI and trying to crowbar, if you like, this, this object interface into CSI. It's just another interface that allows us to deal more successfully with objects that are external to the environment. Very good. Anyone want to add on anything to that? Okay, let's go, let's go on to a next question then. So given the, the volume, the sensitivity, the hybrid nature of data generation today, cross locations, broad access for users, does object storage include security, encryption, key management types of capabilities built into the solution deployment? Who would like to take a first stab at answering that? Uh, sure, I, I'll, I'll take a I'll take a first uh, first cut at it, and the answer is absolutely. Um, as it was something that was a critical part of the object storage environment because it was designed as a cloud, you know, a cloud storage setting. Uh, security was paramount. So I was built in, including key management, including encryption. Um, yeah, and, and, of, and of course, adding on to that uh, immutability, data immutability. So yes, that's all built into the platform. It was a key part of it. We have, uh, well, at my company, we've got security certifications uh, that are as extensive as you have with any enterprise storage platform. So you, it's, it's a very critical part of what we do. Very good. Anyone want to add on anything else to that? Yeah, I just want to add that, that one of the things that's becoming increasingly important, and, and it's uh, you're seeing a lot more discussion of it, is end-to-end -end encryption. And that mm -hmm. includes, obviously, the storage at the back end as well. So it's not just unique to objects. There's a huge industry effort to make sure that we can actually provide you with secure and private environments, um, regardless of what the storage is, whether it be object file, block, key value, doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah, and improving the performance of encryption such that you can do it across everything, um, you know, more pervasively um, without without that performance penalty that you've had in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, security is a it's a huge deal um, and it really forces considerations end to end, Christine, like you're saying, mm -hmm. um, all the way from data generation to processing to uh, providing those results in a secure and perhaps private environment too. Um, I know that SNEA is uh, taking a leadership position in that, especially 
not only with object store, but pretty much all types of storage, including computational storage, uh, to ensure that because it's it's basically uh, a new and changing and and uh, issue with with challenges that continue at a uh, just a, a, a an amazing growth rate on on uh, something that we need to proactively address. So within the um, many of the te technical documents that are driven by SNEA, uh, security is, is uh, a paramount concern for us. Absolutely. David, we've got a question for you here on computational storage and, and using that with S3 Select. Usually an object storage solution doesn't write an object to a single disk. There's some kind of erasure coding for data protection, durability, probably some type of file type, some type of file system as an abstraction layer, which the disk may not even be aware of. So, so how would that work? Also, how is the data usually encrypted? And would S3 Select be able to parse that original object data if it's out on a single drive? Um, so the this the demonstration that I showed before, it currently runs on a single drive, but the uh, the view is it can we could actually parse out the data and run it on uh, an array of drives uh, with some uh, API that can can basically uh, assign which drives are going to be running on which which data sets. Um, so and would that happen then after the data is distributed between the drives? You know, for that durability using erasure coding or or some type of replication technique. Then, yeah. then would they would you come in and run the analytics? It, it would be so that mm -hmm. would be that would be after the erase recording is performed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would it run against um, data that's been encrypted? If it's getting encrypted before it's written across the drives, or would the data have to be unencrypted? Do you know? So it actually that's an interesting question. It can be it can do both. Um, so we can decrypt the data and then perform that analytic. Uh, we're also looking at a new approach to security called fully homomorphic encryption, where the data does not have to be decrypted, yet you can still compute on that data. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. that's, that's a number. We, we have a number of examples that we can show on that. One example um, we shoot, showed yesterday, in fact, uh, at our forum was that um, you could take a COVID database from uh, where we performed a merge from a hospital source and also from a, a private clinic, mer merge that database into, into one larger database and do a, a search on that for specific trends around COVID patients. And uh, all that was being done uh, without decrypting the data, primarily because of privacy concerns. Mm -hmm. And using this uh, FHE technique, uh, running in computational storage drives allow it, allowed us to do so. So we can decrypt the data, uh, and then also we can compute on encrypted data, which is uh, a pretty neat thing to do as well. Yeah, very cool example. Okay, let's see here. Sort of a two-part question. First of all, what is an API? And then second part... Where does KV command specification that's in the NVMe 2.0 spec sit within that S3 Amazon stack? How does that change the API structure? Well, I can hit the first part. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> I'll leave. I'll leave the second part to one of you guys. But on the first part, the S3 API is 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 the language that Object Storage speaks, and it was the language that was established by AWS for, for their object storage environment. Um, it's become a de facto standard, you know, although there is no there is no specific you know standard body for this. It's, it's an Amazon thing uh, because it is so widely adopted and it is fully documented. You know, Amazon makes it fully public and it's regularly updated. Uh, you know, it has been, been adopted as the language that everyone is using. So the beauty is that we're all writing to it. Everyone uses the same commands, the same error codes. Um, it operates exactly as if it were a standard. I'll leave the second part to one of you guys. Yeah, 
can do any of you guys know. I don't think any of us are Amazon experts here, but. <laughs> now, the, I mean, this, the simple answer is the APIs also allow you to shim things. So basically you can have a, a, a way of accessing data at a top level, but underneath yeah. that, what is actually happening physically is completely different. And the bit between the two is the shim. And basically what the, what the, um, the, 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 the S3 is being translated into key values. So in other words, none of the S3 stuff changes. You just do S3 stuff at the top. And what we've done is we've slid this uh, NVMe or, or key value piece in underneath the API before we talk to the device. And the device might actually talk key value as well. So that's, that's coincidental. The idea is that the application talks S3, the end of the API then translates that into whatever is appropriate for the medium that it's, the data is stored on. So it, it's independent of the S3 layer. It, shims are wonderful. I, you know, it, software has been through so many iterations, but, but, but shims remain a constant. The fact that you can take something and translate it into something else and do so easily and readily. It's just wonderful stuff. It allows us to talk S3 at the top level, whatever we want underneath it. Fair enough. And another related question to that, which Alex, you may want to take as well, is the entire key value database from a given S3 bucket being downloaded to the local drive? Okay, so in, in the, the there's a great saying that I quite like when it comes to this kind of stuff, and it's don't do that. <laughs> and, and don't do that is to do, to do with the movement of data. If you can possibly do it, avoid moving data. And the idea here is that we're not downloading an entire S3 bucket into a key value data store. We're actually simply implementing our data and, and data collection that happens to live on um, you know, you know these, these key value drives. Moving stuff about, it's okay if you're going to do backup. In fact, that's really copying data. That's, that's not moving it about. But if you can possibly avoid moving data, then, then, then do, you know, don't do it. Don't go there. You, know, you, you should always be designing applications to minimize data movement. And another related question, do I need to transform to key value? Or can I just query S3? So that's that the API the again. Thing? Yeah, that's, that's back to the API. The API is doing the translation. Fair enough. Okay, let's see here. Does there's any one, mean... one I... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Alex. I, thought was, I was just going to say there's one I really want to cover because I think it's really of interest to, to all of us that are talking here today. And it's the one about analytics and object storage. Isn't it slow and difficult? Have, ah. there, have there been any changes in the area that made analytics faster? And I think the, there are two answers here, and they're, they both intermesh really, really, really well. The first is, if you look at what we're doing with key value and, key va and computational storage, we're pushing the computation out to where the data is. That's the first thing. That's a really good place to do your computation. Do it next to the data. Do it on the data where it lives and where it's been collected. The second thing is parallelism. This gives us the opportunity to do things much more in parallel and to collect in the data that we've analyzed locally into a central database or set of data to be able to analyze further. And that parallelism is a real benefit as well. And we really need to be thinking about when we're designing applications as one, where is the data and how do we compute on it locally, where the data is? And two, how do we parallelize this as much as possible to make sure that we can get analytics working to our benefit? The last thing we really want is analytics that looks like a pipeline. That's the wrong analogy. We need an analytics that looks like a, I don't know, rainfall. You know, it's, 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 it's all simultaneously happening and we collect all that at the bottom and we can do it much more quickly. So I'd, I'd, I'd say that analytics might have been slow, but it doesn't need to be. And I'm a great believer that we've got a lot of really cool solutions for speeding up analytics enormously. Well, I'm just, the fact, huge just the fact that you can do the analytics at the location as opposed to having to move the information to someplace else and then do it is by itself an enormous acceleration. Yeah, absolutely. 
Couldn't agree yeah, more. you can have a, an, like we were talking about, right? You can have an array of computational storage drives either at one location to parallelize the, the functional push down and accelerate it even further. Um, you can have a distributed compute situation where um, you have a number of data collection points, each with their own computational storage drives. You can actually uh, have tight coupling through say CXL uh, with heterogeneous compute solutions where you're able to um, still tap into those computational storage resources within the drive themselves. Uh, but then also couple that tightly with, with host processing resources. So that takes it from just a component level to an actual system architecture level. Uh, the other part to consider is that, um, so th th there's an obvious utility in having, uh, you know, compute at IOT and sensor sites uh, at the edge. You can actually build in edge aggregation points as well. Uh, so you don't have to send the data all the way back to, to the cloud uh, for, for, for uh, real-time analytic determination. You can actually do some, have some uh, micro data centers with edge aggregation for compute resources um, closer to where the data is collected to. So there's all these wonderful different layers that you can add uh, and tailor them according to the application that you're, you're supporting. Yeah, I, I think you're right, David. And, you know, a lot of object storage solutions were at least initially treated as sort of cheap and deep storage, right? Mm. And that's probably where it got the reputation for being slow. But you can configure your servers that your object storage solution is running on however you want for as much capacity, processing power, types of drives, you know, to mm -hmm. deliver the kinds of performance to meet your requirements. I saw we got a question here that, that kind of dovetails with that, you know, what types of platforms does object storage run on? Is, is it an appliance? John, do yeah, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, so that's, that's really critical because it's, if you're going to distribute your storage wherever it needs to be, you need to be able to run on whatever platform is available and whatever platform makes sense there. So object storage is the only enterprise platform that I know of, enterprise storage environment I know of, which can essentially run anywhere. You know, it can run on a containers environment, it can run on a VM, it can run on a bare metal server, it can even run in a public cloud environment. So you can get a, a unified view of your data regardless of what platform that data resides on. And to, and to me, that's that's a unique capability of object storage and what makes it so useful as a, as a private cloud environment. And another related question, object storage delivers many capabilities, but also some new challenges, such as the need for geographic and local load balancers in a distributed scale out infrastructure that does not become the bottleneck of the object services with unsustainable cost. Are there any solutions today that have these features built in? Yeah, it's called rewriting your applications. <laughs> not, not completely not completely but you need to recognize that some of the things that object storage gives you as a benefit and, and some of the things that new technologies give you as a benefit we've we've mentioned a few today may require you to rethink the way you write applications and i i, I think that's a, a one of the key things that a lot of people you know here's here's a controversial statement I think Kubernetes is a legacy technology. How is that for a controversial statement? The idea that we are actually packaging up applications in the way that we do is actually to cover up for or, or try and cure some of the problems we previously had. And we really need to be thinking about new applications and new ways of developing things, microservices in particular, which gives a huge flexibility that we've never had before. So yeah, rewrite your applications. That's, you know, there, there are some things you can't fix, and fixing dud applications is one of them. All right, fair enough. Well, we have run out of time today. We're at the top of the hour. Let me just summarize by saying um, I mentioned you can download the slides today using that attachments button. 
Also, please rate this webcast. It really provides us with great feedback to let, let us know whether we're hitting the right topics at the right depth, meeting the expectations that were set by the, um, the title and the abstract. So this webcast is going to be available in the SNEA Educational Library, along with a copy of the slides, if you don't download them today. We'll also have a Q&A, including answers to the questions that you asked that we weren't able to get to. And we'll be posting that on our blog at the address here. And you can also follow us on Twitter at, at SNEA NSF. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks, Alex and John and David, for your great presentations and answering questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. All right. Thanks much, Thank you. guys. <laughs>